It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our last uh, speaker, Prahlad Singh, who's president and chief operating officer at Perkin Elmer. Uh, he's moved very up very rapidly within Perkin Elmer. He joined four years ago and then started to run one piece of the company and uh, a few months back was promoted to the position of president to manage the entire company. But he has a long uh, career path in uh, pharma and medical devices. He worked at, uh, uh, when he was a student at Northeastern University, he was working for DuPont Chemicals, uh, DuPont Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then he worked for GSK, then he's worked for Philips, he's worked for GE Medical. Uh, so he's really seen the whole gamut of, uh, of that industry. And one of the, the uh, special relationship I have with Prahlad is that when he was a student and I was a coach for our case competitions, and I did it for a couple of years, he was on the team and we had a spectacular year. We came this close to winning the whole damn thing, uh, but it just slipped through our fingers. But it's still something that we think about fondly. And uh, Prahlad was a very important member of, of the team. And I could see even back then that you know this guy is going to uh, go places, do things. So it's very nice to have you back on campus, uh, Pranad, and uh, appreciate the time that you're giving us. And uh, tell us your story. Well, you know, your professional life's taken a full circle when uh, your teacher invites you to talk in front of uh, bunch of very smart people. <laughs> but uh, you know what I will say is that if you are here to hear about China, then you should probably have left after Professor Enright's talk, because he pretty much summarized it. You know, Especially if you look at his quote, where in the book he talks about the fact that you know, if you talk about China, fortune favors the prepared. And I think that's a very important quote. But sort of what I would like to share with you over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is our experience in China. But before I share with you our experience in China, I want to share, share with you a little bit about who we are and what the company is, because that's an important piece of the story as to how it connects to China. <clears throat> so Perkinoma is a leading global technology company that's got three basic uh, pillars. Imaging, detection, and services. What does this mean? You know, in 2018, we ended at about 2.8 billion in revenue, or 3.6 EPS, and about 8.3 billion uh, in market cap, which is, you know, fortunately for us, crossed 10 billion by now. But I think what's more important is also to see the growth. You know, over the past four years since I like to take credit is 2014 is when I joined the company. <laughs> this uh, revenue has gone up 35%. EPS has gone up close to 50% and the market cap has more than doubled. Uh, if you look at it over a 10, meter, uh, 10 year period, you know, and compare it to S&P or the healthcare index, this is the fastest growing company in terms of market cap with 595% appreciation over a 10 year period. So the longer you hold Perkin Elmer share, the better off you are. That's my pitch. <laughs> but I think why is a question that you should think of as to, you know, what's more important is what are the markets we play in? And you know, and I'll bet that all of you have been touched by a company one way or the other. And one example I'll give you is in the field of diagnostics. So there are about 150 million pregnancies worldwide. Of those 150 million pregnancies, only 25 million pregnancies today are tested for, uh, when, uh, the, uh, in the first or the second trimester for genetic disorders, Down syndrome as an example, right? And 40 million babies are tested. So 140 million newborns every year. Of that, only 40 million newborns are tested for inborn errors of metabolism, genetic disorders in the first 72 hours of birth. So why it's key and pertinent to test the baby at birth is because then you can put preventive measures uh, in order to save the life of the baby, or, for example, in thyroid, 
right? If there is a TSH hormone uh, genetic issue, then you can basically give a pill a day for the child for the rest of his life. And if you don't, uh, if you don't detect it at birth, then there's mental retardation and other uh, you know, serious symptoms that have an onset uh, in teenage and uh, young adult age. So this is a very important aspect of healthcare. In the US, it is a law. So at birth, you know, if either you or if you have kids, uh, when the child comes uh, from birth, they get a heel prick. So basically the child gets a heel prick, they take a couple of drops of blood and put it on a dry blood spot card, which is then shipped to a lab where with a puncher, automated puncher, it's put in a well, which goes into an instrument where it's, uh, there are assays and it's tested for uh, several disorders. And then it goes on an informatics platform and then it goes back to the healthcare institution. The government pays for it in the US. So this is one of those rare cases where you don't have to depend on Medicare or Medicare or insurance companies. This is a law. Uh, the states decide how many disorders you test for. For example, California tests for more than 60 disorders. Massachusetts tests for, I think, around 12 disorders. And the states get to pick which disorders are important in their particular state. So that's uh, you know, an example of how every one of us is touched by our products. And this is a large market. Uh, second is life sciences. If we work with most pharma research companies and academia in developing products that help them either in their imaging or detection of diseases or during their research period. Those of you who are fortunate enough to take uh, science in college uh, would have come across atomic absorption, mass spec, IR instrumentation that are used uh, in, in science and chemistry. Food is an important business for us, which is one of the fastest growing businesses. If you look at the addressable market cap of overall food, it's $60 billion. The space we play in is much shorter. In food, another category that we are looking at now is cannabis. Cannabis is something which is now, as you know, regulated in a lot of states uh, and in some countries like Canada, where it's legal. But what has still not developed or become really uh, matured is the testing, the safety and quality testing of uh, cannabis. So that's where we play with labs, state labs in most cases, in developing a protocol and a testing mechanism for cannabis. And the last one is in the applied markets. Whereas, uh, say for example, again, as I said, spectrophotometry or atomic absorption photometry, where we build products uh, for the industrial and environmental market. So why is this important and how does this play into the China story, right? So if you look at 2014, you know, our company was much more dependent on environmental and applied markets, which was mostly instruments. And diagnostics was, for example, and life sciences was a small proportion of our portfolio. So what it did, it did was it made it very dependent on cyclical uh, environments, economic cycles, governmental challenges. Uh, it was very dependent on external factors which were not in control of the company. Since then, what we've done is we've evolved the portfolio to a point where diagnostics and life sciences are a much bigger aspect of our business, along with food and applied and environmental is a much smaller percent of our portfolio. Moms are gonna get pregnant and our babies are gonna be born. That's uh, something which we know. And people do need food and safe food. So for us, the uh, dependency on external factors has become much less and that is what is seen in the organic growth, which has gone from low single digit to mid single digits. <clears throat> and there you see the, you know, the opportunity also has increased in terms of the addressable market that we look for and the organic revenue, the growth that the company has seen over the past four years. One of the other aspects that we've also thought of is that how do we change the portfolio of our company, not from just from a mixed perspective, but also from a geographic perspective. And, you know, and as, as you see on the left side of the chart, you know, in 2014 or 13, 
we were much more focused on the developed markets, but today, you know, emerging markets are getting to be close to nearly half our business. And, and why is this important? You know, three billion of the world's population will be between China and India, right? So guess where most of the babies are gonna be born? China has got 17 million births. India has got 27 million births. But why this is pertinent? You know, while, as I mentioned, in, uh, in, in the US, California tests for 20, uh, more than 50 disorders. Massachusetts is somewhere in the teens. China, it took us 13 years from when we began our process of trying to get the government to start looking at newborn disorders. 13 years before it became a program. India, we are still in the process. You know, I've been in the company more than five years and we are doing pilot projects in a few states. So what, what the, the key really is that we know that a disproportionate amount of GDP spend in China and India is going to be on life sciences, health, food, and, uh, and healthcare. And that's where we need to be present. So that's why it was pertinent, not just to change the portfolio mix of our business, but also our geographic presence. The other aspect that we've also realized is that as you evolve in the life cycle of the company, it's much more important to build products or focus or you know, engage yourself in products which are able to be more agile and less boxes. So the idea was how do we make less boxes and more wilds? Because you know, that, that's where not just the growth lies, but that's also where the revenue lies. So it's more important to use instruments as a ways to the means rather than as your nucleus. So now, sort of changing the story, now that I've given you a view of who we are as a company, as to why China is important, right? Whatever, what you see at the bottom of the slide is you know, things that you've seen today from most of the presenters. It's a big market, it's an important market, it's a big economy, and it, it, uh, if you want to be a truly multinational global company, you have no choice but to be in China. And now look at the end markets that we play in and how it you know, maps up, maps out, if you look at what the needs of the China is. Food, healthcare, labs, uh, uh, consumables, environmental, all of these. But you know, it's not that, I, I know the, the, the topic and the discussion focuses around China, but this is pertinent in every market, whether it's developed or developing. But what is different in China is execution and how the government focuses its attention on factors that are important. Uh, you heard uh, from Professor Enright that China is slow. You heard from the previous speaker that China is fast. Guess what? China is slow and fast. And it is no different than the US or India or any other market. Right? What becomes important is that how the local governments deal with what is important for their particular population. And I think that's where China is way ahead of the game because they know what is important for them and they don't play for the next quarter or the next year. They play for the next decade and the next century. That's where the game changes. So, to give you an aspect of what, I hope I didn't miss the slide. So localization, you know, one of the ways we've dealt with this, uh, you know, issue, and this is not just specific to China. Let me give you three examples of how trade wars and tariffs have played an important role in the market, right? That today are hot, hot button topics. Saudi Arabia decided not to take products from Canada, right? Brexit is a hot burning issue right now. China tariffs is an issue, and you know, now you can add Mexico to the list. So this is, this is not going away. So I think as global multinational companies, you know, if you want to be a truly global player, you've got to figure out a formula that allows you the ability and flexibility to have a footprint in strategic markets around the world so that you can plug and play. This is not going to be easy, but I don't think you have, we have a choice. And that's our focus and that's how we are looking at it. 
So, you know, if from, from our particular perspective, China continues to remain the single largest market for us outside the U.S., and that's not going to change in the near or distant future. It continues to be a high double or low, uh, low double-digit growth com uh, country for us. But what they have done is that the barriers have continued to increase slowly but surely. Regulatory requirements, you know, uh, requirements for local presence. For example, if a tender comes out, all they have to do is put a box that says local manufacturing needed. Companies that have only local manufacture can apply. Now tomorrow, this could move from products developed locally only, right? And, and there could be various versions of it that you can imagine. But you know, if, as a global entity, we have to be prepared for all such scenarios and, and plan for it to the best of our ability. But life goes on, again, to, you know, to use uh, uh, Professor Enright's work. Uh, increasing trade barriers and duties uh, continue to play a role, and local, local prayers are maturing. That's one aspect, and, and you heard that also from the previous speaker. It's not just on cost or price. One of the things that they have the ability is to go and establish companies and businesses and eat a loss for a long period of time. I mean, and this is not just in uh, regulated industries. I mean, if you go and look at uh, renting bicycles in China, if you go, and, and you've seen, I'm sure, if those of you have traveled, suddenly there'll be orange, yellow, blue, all colored bikes of different companies. There'll be thousands of them, right? And they are able to withstand uh, the investments needed for growth for a much longer period of time than what either a private equity company in the US but much more for sure, a publicly listed company in the US can do. And I think that's the ability that they have. <clears throat> so what, what have we done? Over the past decade or more, you know, we've been in China for 40 years, we've been around for 100 plus years. We have now moved strategically what we decided about a decade, more than a decade ago, <clears throat> is that we are going to be in China for China. It's not going to be a market or a country where we are going to put products in made in Europe or the US. Uh, we uh, started acquiring uh, local entities. We did not change the brand names of those companies. They exist as a local company. And our perspective has been that how do we transfer the amount of requisite technology that is required for us to qualify as a country for country? And what that allows us is to be a local Chinese company in China with a footprint infrastructure. So we've got more than 50,000 square meters of manufacturing ability you know, uh, in China today. It is very difficult to distinguish us from a Chinese company unless and until you really look for it. Right? And this is what we will have to do, not just, uh, not just us. In order to be successful, protectionist barriers and nationalistic tendencies are going to be important in all countries. You know, this is the trend. The question is that we as multinationals, how do we prepare ourselves for that? And you know, these are some examples of what we have been doing to, to, to get to that. Just an example of the products that we have built in China. Right? The names don't matter, the pictures don't matter, the boxes don't matter, but the point really here is that what we did is we decided to develop products in China for China, but now we are taking products manufactured in China to other markets, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Eastern Europe, in Latin America. We want to be able to use, leverage our Chinese capability, not just for the country, but eventually make it more of what we refer to as a global strategy. We've got more than 2,500 people in the country. Uh, we've got 18 facilities in the country. So for us, you know, for me specifically, right, if I go to China, it's not that like I'm at a particular different site. You've got to sort of ingrain this in the culture of the company that, you know, whether you're in China or India or Africa, you are a company that's in that market for that market. And that's been you know, an important source of our, of our growth. 
But really what we have tried to do, you know, as we look at the end markets where we play, diagnostics, food, applied, and life sciences, these are the four end markets that we focus on. And what we've really tried to do is how do we develop products and innovate by differentiating the offerings that we provide to our customers, right? Because in order for you to, to excel and succeed, it's a me to doesn't survive for a long period of time, irrespective of the market or the end market you serve. But the ability to be able to provide a differentiated offering is what is important. And what that does is that if you have a differentiated offering, tariffs, trade wars become less relevant because then you know, it is a must have rather than a good to have product and technology. And I think you know, uh, that, that's where our focus has been. And, then, and going forward, that's where we'll continue to, to uh, have our, our investment. So the net sum of this is, is as follows. China was 275 million in 2014 for us. It's more than doubled over four years. So if you can do the math, we are close to 3 billion. You can see how important China is for us. And I would suspect that you know, this trend is not going to reduce or plateau. This trend is going to you know, you know, continue, to, continue to stay on the same trajectory. For us, what is more important is that how do we manage being a publicly listed company with our long-term strategic objective? And, and that's the balance and that's the dance that, you know, and this is not just unique to us, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's commonplace for all publicly listed companies. It's how do you figure out what's the right balance between present and the future? So that's our focus. What we've tried to do is provide, as I said, differentiated abilities, serve attractive end markets and geographies, deliver on the results that we promise to our shareholders, but most importantly, do something that has a global impact. And, and the, what I will leave uh, you with is that every person, every employee of the company, when he or she comes in and punches their card and leaves uh, at the end of the day, we have saved 75 babies. And we know that because uh, we have the informatics platform. Remember I told you the whole value chain from the heel prick to the uh, re results delivered to the institution? We build each one of those. We uh, make the card, we make the well, we make the puncher, we make the assay, we make the instrument, and we have the software informatics platform. So we know how many positives were there at the end of the day. And it's, uh, it's pretty passionate and it, you know, our employees are very passionate about the fact that when you know that, you know, if you don't pardon the use of my word, screw up, you have saved 75 babies that day. So I'm gonna leave, with you, leave you with that thought. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your very interesting remarks. Would you explain a little bit more how you can be so integrated into uh, Chinese business you, uh, while still being an American head, uh, headquartered company? What's your workforce like? And it's, I think of the analogy of individuals being immigrants to another country, but never, they're bicultural. How do you deal with that? Uh, it's a very interesting question. I think the biggest, uh, the biggest investment is time. You know, and I think that's, uh, this is not something that happens overnight. And, and you know, in this case, it's much more of a learning for our non-Chinese colleagues. So the learning curve is much bigger for the non-Chinese colleagues who are either in Europe or the US or India or Vietnam, rather than for our Chinese colleagues. I mean, we tend to go into a market, and this is not China specific again, any multinational market. You expect things to work the way you have seen it, right? And I think if you set your parameters that as long as it's legal, it's compliant, and it's uh, you know, uh, around the norms that you have set as your culture and your obligation, you've got to be flexible uh, in terms of how you operate in different markets. 
And that flexibility and open-mindedness is what is most important. But I think the shortest answer I can give you is that the only way do you do is you persist and you give it time. And eventually what happens is that whatever the market, it's that people, your employees who are not in that market, the number one thing you've got to do is start saying that you should not assume that what you're bringing in is better than what is already there, whether it's a process or a practice or a product. And I think if you go in with the assumption that you know, your colleagues there know as much or if not more than you, it's much, much more of a fruitful and a uh, profitable interaction for shareholders in the long term. I think I missed the first part of the presentation, sorry. But um, do you have a joint venture partner? If so, what is the split? And um, do you, you, you said that um, you have an R&D lab there, is, and it's um, the, a lot of these products and research being done just for the Chinese market. Um, so you don't bring technologies from elsewhere in the company to China? So we don't have a joint venture. We, are, we have made uh, inorganic acquisitions over the past decade which we have used as a nucleus for our presence in China. Uh, our products are mostly developed in China for China, but we've definitely brought in technology from Europe, US, and all our other, uh, other entities that we have uh, into China. But the idea really is that the development work we do is mostly organic. It's in country for country. And uh, we've got probably more than 300 R&D, a team of more than 300 R&D in China. I have a question here. Yeah, hi, Prala. Really great presentation. You talked about good growth in China. Can you talk about profitability and how bringing them any profits out of the country? I can't uh, break down the profitability for the market, you know, given that we don't disclose that public, uh, publicly separately. But I can tell you that it is no different than what we, uh, what we uh, have in other markets which are uh, like the US or, or other markets. So we don't uh, sacrifice profit for growth is the way I would say that. Can you address the fact that since you've acquired other companies and you're in ownership of all of your production in China, intellectual property protection for you, do you have a specific lock? Has this environment changed for you over the past 10 years? Can you give us some context there? Because one of the things we all know is that IP protection is a concern in China versus India, where it's a little bit more favorable. So trying to wrap our heads around that. Yeah. You know, I, I will say that and this is my personal view, maybe. I, I, I don't think that IP protection is uh, any different than China generally speaking, than it is in India or, or in some of the other markets. I, I would say that what is important and pertinent is what is the technology that you work on and how much of that technology that you bring into that market, right? So for example, if you're building a car, I mean, if the, uh, if the IP, if the core of the IP is around the engine, then do you make the engine in China or do you make it in Timbuktu? Similarly, in our case, you know, when we are building something, you know, what is the buffer developed and manufactured in China or is the reagent or is the assay or the chemistry? You as a company have got to make a decision as to what part of the process do you do it in country or outside? So to tag team on that, if you're building it in China for China, are there restrictions on IP and is that additional revenue for China if you do end up um, creating some type of license agreement? So repeat that question again, sorry. If you are building... But, yeah, so if you develop for China in China, are they owning the intellectual property rights? But they is we, right? Oh, okay. So, there you go. So then you are already negotiating. Okay. Um, I was curious in terms of, for a long time, Perkin Amos has always been known for women's health. And now you're kind of diversifying into life sciences and everything else. And even though you're building in China for China, 
how are you sort of integrating, because the corporate culture in terms of Perkin Allen being a US company, and trying to get people to adopt, you know, in terms of the corporate philosophy of, you know, in terms of the headquarters. Um, I don't know if you're bringing people in from US to go to China or, you know, hiring people in China, but how are you sort of integrating everything? Because you're going into a new market, so to speak, in terms of life sciences and trying to get all the Chinese people either to, you know, adopt in terms of your culture or vice versa, um, you know, US going to China, understanding that culture there. Yeah, I mean, I suspect it's going to be a long-winded answer to the question, but I'm going to try and see how uh, uh, I can be specific. So, you know, yes, we are expanding beyond mother and child, right, and in, into other markets. I think the really new end market that we have focused on recently is food. Uh, life sciences, we have been. It's just that we didn't call it life sciences. We've sort of started calling it life sciences as a market. But the, the question really is how do, you, uh, how do you focus on cultural assimilation of uh, your team in China versus teams outside? I mean, there are various ways, right? A lot of our colleagues, we have exchange programs, right? We call that perceptorship or you know, something like that, where colleagues from uh, uh, China come into our Turku facility in Finland or Hopkinton here in Massachusetts and, and other places. And similarly, colleagues from here go and spend a lot of time in China. I think what we have focused on, and maybe that's where we uh, sort of try to be very uh, keenly sensitive about it, is that we have not, we've never sort of uh, propagated uh, the thought process or culture that we need to take stuff into China and educate China or tell China or, you know, it's always been the other way. We've always sort of, you know, enhanced uh, the talent and colleagues who are more interested in going and learning that what can I learn from China and how can I help and how can I serve the company. So if sort of you, you want to make sure that you choose the right talent who are open-minded and, and, uh, and, and willing to do that. But I think, you know, it comes back to the answer to the first question, right? Time. You've got to invest time in this. This is not something that happens overnight. You know, but if you invest time, you know, you see that the results that you saw on the slide, you know, it, 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 does, it does yield results in the long term. Uh, but Pranad, four years is not a very long time. And you came into the company and whatever its culture was, you must have done something that allowed you to take off like a rocket compared to the past. Well, I think I also had uh, favorable uh, trends in my favor, you know. Uh, so Very rare for a CEO to accept, admit that they, they were helped by tailwind. Uh, because, you know, awareness around newborn screening uh, was catching up. That definitely helped. We made some inorganic acquisitions. And overall, the market trend around healthcare awareness, food testing, you know, you had that, there was this whole milk issue, uh, if you recall, around 2012, 2011. So the market trends were favorable. Uh, 16, 17 million babies are a lot of babies, right? So we were helped also by external trends. But I think what we focused on is executing right and not executing as a multinational. In the morning, we thought about how media, media industry in China is heavily regulated for acquisition in your life sciences or diagnostics. How you know, local rules and regulation impact for quick acquisition for local industry. Can you share your thought on that? The Chinese uh, FDA yeah. is much more stringent than the US FDA. I don't know about that. No, I'm, the, I'm telling you, so the, uh, that's what I'm sharing with you. So the Food and Drug Administration is a legal, regulatory body that, that you know, those of you who are in the healthcare industry are fully aware of it. I would say that the CFDA, which is the Chinese equivalent of uh, the FDA, is uh, probably as uh, diligent is the word I'm going to use as, uh, as the US FDA is. So the regulatory environment is no different if not more stringent in China. So we have to operate under that, uh, under that environment in most parts of the world. So th this is our, you know, it's our bread and butter and, our, and the life we live, which is good. 
So uh, maybe a naive question, but how significant of an impact did the change to the one-child policy have on your bottom line? That is uh, absolutely a very good question. So I would not classify that as a naive question. So you know what is interesting uh, is that you know we trend we trend birth rates. So those of you who are avid readers of The Economist must have seen last year that there was a significant drop in birth rates in China. In some of the larger cities, it was double digit. And this is about 18 or 24 months after the one child policy was uh, released, I guess is the term. Basically what we saw is we saw a spike in birth rates uh, for about two, three quarters. We saw, we have a precursor. We also test for the moms. So we saw a spike in pregnancies after the one child policy was released. But over a period of time, by about, I would say, 14 to 18 months, it came back down. And then it's, it's gone into a decreased birth rate. And our market research shows that you know, most of these birth rates, you know, the high focus is on the large cities in China. You know, take uh, whether it's uh, Shenzhen or obviously the known culprits, Shanghai, Beijing, and all of that. Uh, grandparents don't want to take more care of more than one child, right? Uh, there is not enough real estate in the house to take care of it. Uh, it's difficult to manage two childs financially, right? So the, it's not the one child policy has had an impact short term, but longer term it's gone down. In fact, now there is a speculation that the government is going to incentivize birth at some point, similar to what they are doing in France and Germany and some of the Western <coughs> European countries. So that's a very interesting data point. So if I may ask a follow-up. So had you planned from a business perspective that birth rates would have gone up consistently on a sustained basis? And then did you have to react to that when they actually went down or? or well. Excellent question again. Uh, so I think, uh, yes, we did plan uh, naively that the government has released the one-child policy and birth rates would go up, and it didn't. But what was important and for us is, remember I talked about the number of disorders that California tests for is above 50. In China, the bigger provinces test for three to five, uh, the, uh, three to six. The other provinces uh, probably test for two and three. So our focus has not been on geographic expansion, but menu expansion is how do we work with the government to increase the number of disorders that they test for. And that's why our growth trajectory, even despite the birth rate challenges, have uh, been sustained. Uh, okay. uh, so I have a generalized question for you. So I just wanted to know look, how political tensions adversely affect the supply chain and the trade markets. Oh, again, I think the, 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 the answer is very similar is if you think about it, right? If you focus on being in China for China or in country for country, right? No, it's not just China. And if you're in country for country, you are sort of to some level insulated if you don't have dependencies on other markets. But more broadly, this is something that most multinationals have to be able to figure out is what is the footprint that they established that sort of insulates to a level of degree that it is possible uh, in terms of uh, heightened uh, nationalistic tendencies or uh, protectionist barriers that countries or regions might put up. Pranad, you, you talked about uh, products developed in country for country, then finding their way in, into other markets. Can you give a specific example and has any of it actually come back to the US or potentially could come back to the US? Yeah, I mean, we've uh, developed a, uh, you know, if you recall, first if you had a flu test and you went to your uh, PCP and you had a flu test, sometimes you would get a rapid test, now you get a rapid test. But I don't know, you know, those of you who are old enough as I am, you know, it used to take a day or two to figure out that you had flu or not, right? So there are these boxes now which are called point of care devices which are now sitting in PCP clinics and, uh, and, and, and doctors, uh, and, doctors and, and, and regional labs, or smaller labs. So we sort of tried to figure out is that you've got those big factory labs like Quest and LabCorp, which have those huge, humongous uh, equipment that run tests like a you know, factory would. 
And then you have got these point of care devices that test for you know, one or two samples per run. So we figured that there's probably a market for something which is in the middle, maybe 10, 20 tests, where somebody doesn't want to make a large investment, but larger practices want to be able to look and focus on developing a specific panel of tests around a box that is affordable. And this became particularly important in China, given the tier one, two, three, four hospitals that, you know, if, as some of you may have heard, that, that they are tiered. And we developed, organically, we developed that box and that technology in China. And lo and behold, what we realized is that when we talked and presented it at our innovation summit, uh, the other commercial leaders from all the other regions started saying, well, why is it only for China? Why can't we get it C marked and use it in Europe? Why can't we use it in Latin America? So this sort of has now moved that, you know, what we call is rather than in country for country, we moved it from a local to a global strategy, wherein now we started taking that box and started selling it in India, registering it in India, Southeast Asia, and other markets. And then eventually it's going to go from local to global to global. And, and that's something that, uh, you know, there are many such innovations which are coming out of China, which are being used in markets outside of China. I want to see if we can use your experience as a way of rounding our, out our whole discussion this whole morning. So as you step back, in the last year, do you feel that the US-China uh, trade dispute has become more pronounced? Is that the way you perceive it? I think the rhetoric has. And I think the rhetoric has and the noise has. And I think generally, and again, I'm speaking out of school here, not uh, more as a general comment than, than uh, either as a politician or as a company, uh, is the fact that the rhetoric and noise has, and, and as you heard from all our speakers, right, uh, multinationals uh, hunker down and do what they need to do. And the idea really is that how are you able to eliminate all the noise that's going around and be able to figure out that you are agile to deal with the tariff trade wars and, and such barriers that come through. Because we don't have the luxury of waiting for governments to make decisions around their trade negotiations, right? We've got a quarter to close and, and a year to close. So we stay focused on what our, our objective is, i.e., uh, deal with uh, such uh, in uncertainties in the best possible manner with the amount of decision and data we have today. So has anything changed in the way you operate? Or do you anticipate anything changing in the way you operate? For instance, where you make stuff, where you source stuff, where you sell stuff, where you develop and do R&D and so on in the last year? or as pretty much nothing really materially changed. So we've always tried to be agile enough that we know that we uh, sort of, you know, something could happen along these lines. Now, some of these you foresee, I mean, US and China are two large trading pattern partners, so you know. We couldn't foresee Saudi Arabia, Canada, for example, right? That one we couldn't foresee. So it's not that you're gonna have a, you know, a, a strike rate of a thousand. But in most cases, you foresee and you prepare for it. And so the answer to your question, Ravi, is that we have been more diligent. We've, been, we've made sure that we've got the right you know, command and control in different parts of the world so that in case this ratchets up, we sort of you know, move it from A to B to C. And, and we are ready and prepared for it. So we mitigate our risks and minimize that to the best of our ability, knowing the data we have today. Terrific. Any final questions? Or if not, Prahlad, thank you for wrapping up a wonderful day and with a wonderful session. Thank you. Right.